In this episode, we're going to take a look at how to create single ROM modifications for video game boards from the 1970s and 80s. The idea is we want to take a board like this that has a bunch of ROMs, like you can see on the left, and replace it with one bigger ROM, either in the ROM sockets area or make replace it with a daughter board that plugs into the, C the CPU slot, like this. So to understand how to do this, we have to understand a little bit about the CPU architecture of these games. This is a simplified overview of the computer architecture that most games in the 70s and 80s and 90s used. You have your CPU over here, and when the CPU wants to read or write to memory, it puts an address on the address bus in binary. And that usually has a buffer here, and that's just like an amplifier, really. It also has the ability to shut off a signal. Um, and there's a data bus, the same way. On a old Z80 or 6502, you have a 16-bit wide data bus. And again, you'll probably have a buffer here. And then on the other side of the data bus is something called a buffered data bus. It just means that it's on the buffered side of the data bus. And same thing with the address bus. Now, what the address bus does connects to a address decoding circuit and this reads the actual address that the CPU has requested and turns on one of the ROMs. Okay, So for example if you had four ROMs in the, the circuit or on the motherboard the, the address selector or the address decoding circuit would read the address and figure out which ROM fed that, that the data for that address and then turn on that ROM. And some of the addresses from the address bus will actually also go to the ROMs. Not all of them. Um, usually the buffered address bus comes in and the ROMs only need a small amount. That's why it showed smaller because it does not if you if you had the whole address bus, all 16 bits, you would generally only need one ROM. If you had um, one ROM then it would require all 16 bits of the data bus but um, you don't. You generally have a bunch of ROMs and each one ha only has so many addresses it can hold. So you actually have a smaller amount of uh, addresses going to the of the address bus going to the ROMs. And then again, the address decoding circuit just turns on whatever ROM feeds should feed the CPU the data. And then that ROM will send the data out on the buffered address bus, which goes through the buffer and back to the data bus. Now, there's two ways you can make a single ROM hack you can either re remove all the ROMs in the ROM section and actually then put a new bigger ROM in one of those slots. To do that, you would have to physically alter the um, socket or the, the ROM itself so that the, the pins line up, the address line, the data line pins line up. And for most of the part, they will because larger ROMs will use many of the same uh, pin positions as the previous ROMs or the smaller ROMs. However, you'll have to reroute some things. You will have to reroute power, ground, and then you'll have to tap into address lines that don't exist in the, the normal ROM slot because you will have a bigger ROM, you'll need more address lines. And you may have to reroute some other things like um, chip selects or things like that. So that's one way you can do it. The way we're going to focus on doing it is actually by making a little daughter board that you take the CPU out and you plug the CPU into this daughter board and the daughter board will have a bigger ROM and and it will actually also tap into the address bus and the data bus. Then all we have to do in that situation is program a PAL which will also tap into address bus signals and some control bus signals and that PAL all it has to do is figure out when any of the ROMs are turned on and enable the chip select on the daughter board or the the larger ROM and that's actually much much easier to do than replacing the ROMs the only problem with that is that you actually have to physically make a board but with the price of PCB fabrication now, it, it's so cheap. You can, for a few dollars, like go to Osh Park, I think for $10, you can get 
three boards and um, you know three small boards it might be a little more because that's that a board that size will be or will be a little bigger but you can actually make your own fabricated PCB boards and it's a lot easier than actually trying to tap into the the ROM area what's more is it's also just very convenient you know you can just you don't have to physically hack on the board at all you just simply remove the CPU insert the CPU into your new little daughter board and plug that in and it's good to go so it's really kind of plug and play if you chose to do the other section the, the um, by by taking the physical ROMs and putting a larger one in that spot you really will probably end up hacking the board or have something really ugly and messy and it's it's just not nearly as nice and it's actually more complex because you actually have to figure out um, how to handle the addressing and how to do the chip selects. Now I mentioned the easiest way I think to do this and the cleanest way is to make a daughter board that plugs into the CPU so socket. So what you need to do is simply make a PCB and you'll use a program like Eagle CAD to make this and that's free. You can, you can download Eagle CAD for free and you can use it at least some of its features for free if you want to use the um, more production quality features you have to pay money for it but what you do is you make some terminals points where you will plug it in to the CPU slot and then just offset a little bit and you'll want to actually put holes for a 40 pin socket where you will actually put a new CPU in there the socket in the CPU and just make sure you run all the traces one for one from the terminal strips that will plug into the CPU socket into your own socket that um, then you again you will put the CPU in there and put the whole board into the original CPU slot on the board so run all those those pins then you're gonna want to put a big ROM like a 27 512 which is big enough to hold the, the entire address space that a Z80 or a 6502 can address then you will want to go ahead and run the address lines and the data lines from the, the where the CPU comes in, run them also to the ROM, and, and of course the power. And then you'll also want to run some lines to a GAL or PAL 16V8, or you can use a larger size too, 16V8 um, is fine for my purposes here. And what I've done on my board is I've hooked it up like so. So you can see we have address lines 15 through 10, the read signal or the not read signal, the not mem request, um, of course the ground and the power, a not output enable, that's going to go to your EEPROM to tell the EEPROM when to turn on, not write, not IRQ, not wait, not bus request, not refresh. You can actually skip not bus request and not refresh and not wait and probably not IRQ. But I hooked up all the CPU control lines because when I designed it, I wasn't sure exactly what things I wanted to monitor. So I monitored everything. And then it's important that the not output enable from the PAL goes to the not output enable on the EEPROM. And the not chip enable goes straight to ground. That's enough for this episode. Join us next episode when I'll show you how to program all the ROM data onto the one EEPROM and how to program the PAL to turn on the ROM at the right time. Once that's done, you'll have a plug-and-play working single ROM daughterboard solution.